I know that you are currently focused very much on the Indian democracy. So I would love to know what fascinates you about the Indian democracy and what other governments or democracies fascinate you right now that you think ought to be studied more. My background is in studying post-socialist transition economies. And I originally came to India for the study of its economy. In fact, I co-authored a BRICS book in, I believe it was 20. 16 called Bricks or Bust with Stanford University Press with the late uh, economist Hartmut Elsenhans. And I've written articles and books about um, middle income post socialist transition economies for years now. Um, what really caught me about India was that although I wanted to study the economy and my initial articles were all about the economy, Everyone agreed with me on the economy. <laughs> it was different from China. I mean, I was, I studied in the economy and I thought as reform continues, India's economy is bound to continue to grow and that it's, you know, about 12 years behind China and its growth curve and that India's growth will continue at least until 2035, after which we need to start rebenchmarking what policies exist in 2035. But that was pushing on an open door. Uh, as opposed to my work on China, which was very much against the consensus. I, I had been writing more than a decade ago that China's growth would stall by 2020. And everyone at the time thought I was crazy for saying that. But of course, China's growth has stalled. Um, so I, I really was not particularly interested in India's politics. I had read the academic articles that said India was a miracle, a miracle democracy. Uh, I thought that was interesting. But not particularly interesting. And then what got me looking at the democracy was all these reports of India's democracy in decline. Because you know, I had been learning for decades that India was you know, the only poor country in the world that had run a successful democracy. What was all this talk about democracy in decline? And so I started looking at the indices. And again, my own statistical expertise is on the analysis of country data and their use in benchmarking and studying levels of development you know, across countries. So writing about the indices was exactly in my own statistical training. I wrote a book called Methods for Quantitative Macro Comparative Research. It's a mouthful, but if you want to get it, it's you know, there on Amazon. And so I started looking at the indices and I found that the democracy indices were very poorly constructed. And so this started with the makings of a book that, well, India has always been recognized to be a uh, well-governed democracy, yet the indices are rating India now very badly. Uh, what most people don't realize is that the VDEM index, on which India rates very low, 110th in the world, didn't exist until 2017. So if you were studying India up until 2017, all your information was that India is one of the world's best democracies. Um, we only, quote unquote, found out that India was a bad democracy in 2017. And of course, it only got worse since then on VDEM. Uh, so I switched over, um, you know, it, it leverages my expertise on indices and on st statistical methods for the use of country data, but also it's just fascinating to get involved. And what's been really just a fantastic opportunity for me is that nearly all of the source material on Indian democracy is in English. Today's secondary literature is in English. All the podcasts, I mean, not everyone, but dozens of podcasts are in English. The major news sites in, in India are in English. But more importantly, Ambedkar wrote in English. Prasad wrote in English. Nehru wrote in English. Yeah. Jinnah gave speeches in English. Um, uh, Savakar wrote in English. You know, I, I can... Uh, 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 Subhachandra Bose wrote in English. His, his brother wrote in English. Right? The Constituent Assembly debates were in English. When Nehru gave his speech at midnight on you know, midnight August uh, 14, 15, uh, 1947, of course, he gave it in English. So what was wonderful for me was that I was able to go through for myself without having to rely on secondary sources all of the primary source material on Indian democracy, and with very few exceptions, it's accessible. So it's been a just a great intellectual pleasure studying Indian democracy for the last five years. Yeah, but that feels a little embarrassing that we would prioritize another language over our own. And that is a real problem in India. Like children, parents talk to their children in even in their homes in English, and they feel embarrassed if they can't speak in English. That That's a, a little sad. And I think that is one of the barriers that people who are not 
educated or not educated from English yeah. medium schools. And the, that is the issue they have with understanding what's actually going on. Because as you said, if you can't access the primary um, information sources, how are you ever going to, you know, build on your knowledge and understand what's happening in your country? Well, look, it's, it's a problem, but first, it's an inevitable problem. I don't have to explain to you, though I may have to explain to some of your listeners, that there was no consensus around any other language at the time of independence. The Constituent Assembly punted on the issue and created a language commission that was supposed to solve the problem within 15 years. And the language commission is still doing its work <laughs> you know, right. 75, 77, 78 years later. Um, there simply was no consensus on any other language. When Radhakrishnan gave his talk, and he was the major speaker at midnight on August 14th, when he gave his address, he gave it in English, not because he was making a political statement necessarily. He didn't speak Hindi. So, you know, how can you have a country uh, where your second president who's a, an esteemed philosopher who speaks multiple languages. I mean, he, he wrote, he read Sanskrit. Uh, he, he read multiple European languages. You know, if your second president is an extraordinarily educated person, but who does not speak Hindi, how can you make Hindi your national language? And of course, then there are the political problems of, uh, again, you know, primarily South India, not wanting to accept um, Hindi dominance of the country. Now, one solution is to do what Israel did and resurrect a dead language, but that simply, with the education levels in India, Sanskrit was simply not going to become the national language of India. It was discussed at the time. Um, so the discussions at the time were pretty similar to the discussions that are had now. Yes, it would be ideal if the nation spoke one language, but the nation doesn't speak one language, and the nation is not going to agree which language to speak, so India becomes a common medium. And look, that's a challenge for India, but it's also an opportunity for Indians, which is to say that Indians obviously have a much easier time working abroad. Indians have a much easier time accessing and publishing in international journals and international publications. Um, you know, there's good and bad about it. Uh, you know, I can't tell you what language your country should speak, but I can tell you that there's simply no reasonable alternative for the foreseeable future than for India's elite debate to occur in English. My own thinking language is English. I think in English. That's <laughs> that's I, I see a lot of my people my age trying to correct that. But you are right. And right now I see the Modi government trying to sort of revive Hindi as a, a, a remind people that it is in fact your national language. You should embrace it. They are making some efforts in those direction, which makes me want to ask you, what you think are like there's a lot that's happening right now a lot that's happening especially because yeah, it's but, the but, election season so but if i could put a personal and international perspective on this yeah my name is salvatore babonis that's an anglicized version it should be salvatore vevonis my family's come from italy and greece uh originally they joined the American project. Now, they did it voluntarily. It wasn't like India being colonized. But they joined this English-speaking world voluntarily. And, of course, we all anglicized our names. And you know, I'm thrilled that my great-grandparents decided, and my great-great-grandparents decided that I would be part of the global world, not part of the Italian or the Greek world, that I wouldn't live in some village in the Peloponnese, but that I would live in the New York area. Right? They metropolitanized me. Now, that happened voluntarily for us, but it's also happening in places like Sweden, Denmark, the Netherlands, where education systems are conducted in English. It's been a big controversy in Denmark and the Netherlands, having universities switch to English rather than being taught in Danish or Dutch. But you know, the, country has be the countries have gone that way. I've been in Sweden and heard Swedish teenagers talking in English among themselves even though they're Swedish and there are no international people around. Now, I, I promise you that by the end of this century, the language of the small countries of Northern Europe is going to be English. And languages like Dutch and Danish and Swedish will be taught in schools as a demotic language, as the language of the home, not as the language of the country. That India has a leg up on this effort, you may view it as a tragedy that English is the language of business and journalism, whereas the, region, the the Hindi and the other actual Indian languages are relegated to the home and the sports field. 
But the world is moving towards having a common tongue. I mean, you read any science fiction novel, and they'll all have some variation on the whole galaxy speaks common, or the whole galaxy yeah. speaks galactic. <laughs> it only, right. you know, instead of everybody speaking, except Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, that came up with a clever solution of the babblefish in the ear. But lacking a babblefish, which we don't have, uh, the Eng you know, English is, I'm sorry to say it, it may sound very imperialistic of me, but I've come to peace with it. You know, I've made peace with the fact that my ancestors made the decision for me that I would speak English, not Greek or Italian. And the world is simply moving in that direction. English is no longer the language of England. It is simply the global language. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I don't think it's a tragedy. I think it's it's fine. It's just how it is. And we have to move with the time. And, you know, if you want to continue to be part of the progress, I just hope that, you know, just so we can keep reading our scriptures, all of us, all over the world, we should be, that's the only reason. Call it globish instead of English. And the political connotations are gone. Look, Christians don't read their scriptures in Greek and Aramaic or Hebrew. Christians read their scriptures <laughs> in English. And only specialists can access their original languages. Yeah. Uh, that's, a, you know, that's a sad fact, but you know, that's the reality of the situation. And that's India's reality. I I'm sorry to be you know, very confronting about no, it, no. but English is not going to go away. There's enormous demand for learning English, and English penetration is going to increase farther and farther down the social pyramid in India. Absolutely. I agree with that. And integration does seem to be something to be prioritized. It, it, I think it is in favor of everyone if they focus on it instead of trying to isolate themselves in any respect, be it language or something else. I won't make that argument. I won't view it as good or bad. I view it as inevitable. That is, I'm speaking as a sociologist, not a moralist. I can see lots of arguments, on the one hand, why retaining an authentic national experience is desirable, and I can see other arguments why integrating is desirable, uh, and I respect people on both sides of that debate. I'm not uh, advising for, for English. I'm predicting about English. And that's exactly why I wanted to talk to you, because <laughs> that is your approach. And thank you for making a dis distinction, because a lot of us, we are unable to do so. We don't, like emotions do rule a lot of the arguments. And right now, we are having a lot of discussions around what is going on in the country, because it's the election season. So everything is under the microscope. Everything's looking, you know, people are examining everything and trying to understand as much as an ordinary citizen can understand what do you think are the biggest challenges that are facing Indian democracy right now, considering everything that has happened in the past few months and the, the shifting opinions about the Modi government? People are going to call me a Modi bakht or a BJP bakht because the biggest challenges uh, from a scientific standpoint, from a pure social scientific standpoint, I'd say the two biggest challenges are the need for a uniform civil code. A, a, a democracy requires equality under the law and Indians don't have equality under the law. And democracy requires one person, one vote. And India has been frozen at 1971 levels of representation for states, and there have been massive demographic changes since 1971, and those have not been reflected in changes in the Lok Sabha, with the result that you, know, you now have the crazy situation where people in Kerala and Tamil Nadu have... I forget the number, you can read my research on it, but it's something like 1.4 times the representation of people in Bihar or even even Delhi is underrepresented because lots of people moved into Delhi, migrates, migrated to Delhi, and they don't get any more representation as a result. So they're splitting the same representative. So those are the two big pro challenges for Indian democracy. Now, my list of challenges to Indian democracy is entirely different <laughs> from the critics list of priorities for Indian democracy, but I stand by them. Those are the two things that most differentiate India from other acknowledged democratic countries. All of the other complaints that are made about Indian democracy are complaints that are made everywhere. You know, is the press too concentrated? Do academics have enough freedom? Uh, is there, uh, you know, are are there people, are, are immigrants properly reflected on poll lists and citizenship lists? You know, these are par for the course for democracy around the world. These two issues that I raise, 
equal representation and equality under the law, those are basics that every other democracy in the world accepts that India doesn't have. That is true. I found you to be fair, you know, very fair in the analysis by you that I've read so far that I've, you know, seen on YouTube in your articles. So I feel comfortable asking you this question. I know that there are people who are, you know, more in favor of one party and less so in favor of the other one. And obviously, you know, that happens with all of us. But I feel fairly comfortable asking you this as an ordinary citizen trying to understand this. There is a shift in opinion. Like Modi has done a lot. The Modi government has done a lot. And, and the pace at which they have done those things, the changes in infrastructure, the changes with so many of the... It, it's been... I, I don't think we've seen that pace ever before. But there has been a shift in uh, opinion, or at least there's been a fear that Modi government, like the word dictator, gets thrown around a lot. What happened in the wake of the BBC documentary, the... Uh, the way the government reacted, what is happening with Kejriwal, um, the freezing accounts, and all of these things. So as someone who is studying the government so closely, studying the economy, the politics so closely, what is your opinion? How much should the, should the ordinary citizens be concerned, be afraid? It is a huge democracy. Should we be concerned that we're going to lose vital elements of it? So here's my opportunity to upset the Modi and BJP supporters. <laughs> so I've already upset the Congress and Avapi party supporters. Let, let me upset the Modi and BJP supporters. Um, India's record of progress was just as strong under the Mamun Singh government and the previous 10 years as they have been under Modi. Now, I say that quantitatively. The data don't lie. Um, growth rates were as strong or stronger. People say, oh, things get done now that didn't get done before. And I point out, yeah, that's because India is twice as rich now as it was before. Uh, you know, the Mamun Singh government, I mean, if you say, oh, well, it's twice as rich because of Modi, I said, well, wait a minute. The Mamun Singh government inherited the Vajpayee, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, problems, right? So India has been growing rapidly for the last 20 years. And uh, if people see that growth now, it's only because of the foundation laid by the previous UPA government, which has now been built on by the NDA government, there is no statistical evidence that the rate of delivery has been better or faster now than it was then, unless you want to use it in purely arithmetic terms. So we as social scientists, we always talk about percentage growth. And so the percentage growth is you know, 6, 7, 8% per year. Now, if you want to say that, well, the growth now, you know, if you had a, a, a a thousand dollar economy, the growth of eight percent was only eighty dollars. But now that there's a two thousand dollar economy, the economy is growing at one hundred sixty dollars a year. <laughs> well, that's that's a bit mendacious, right? I mean, the fact is that the economy is larger, and so you see more stuff getting done, and you do see stuff more stuff getting done. more stuff is getting done. But that's only because of the previous growth. <laughs> the other people came in working from a lower base. Now, so the the that's one Modi myth. I think we should demolish. The, the idea that he's been an extraordinarily good economic manager simply isn't reflected in the data. Now, that said, he's not been a bad economic manager. He's been a equally good economic manager as the previous government. Okay. When it comes to these challenges to democracy, um, I think there have been uh, actions taken by the Modi BJP government which I view as illiberal and anti-democratic, whether that's selective prosecutions, whether that's trying to tilt the political playing field in its favor, um, whether that's campaign finance regulation. The reason I don't make a big deal of this in my writing is that the previous government had also tilted the playing field in its favor. And in fact, governments around the world tilt the playing field in their favor. So, you know, just look at what's happening in the United States. Now, whatever your personal views about Donald Trump, I think any sane person can agree that the Democratic Party has pulled out all the stops to prosecute, to search through Trump's extensive history and to try to prosecute him for any possible violation they can find of any kind. Even to the extent of in New York right now, there's a trial going on over a supposed crime that was reclassified from a misdemeanor into a felony specifically for the purpose of being able 
to prosecute Donald Trump for it. Um, of course, the judiciary has been politicized in the United States. I don't agree with that. I condemn it, just as I would condemn the politicization of prosecutions in India. The question is not, is it wrong? Of course it's wrong. The question is, how wrong is it? It is similarly wrong to things that are done both across space in other countries that we all accept are well-established democracies, and it's similar to things across time that were done at other times in India's history when India was acknowledged to be a well-established democracy. Right. Okay. Um, look, murder is wrong all the time, but murders occurred under UPA, and murders occur under NDA, and murders occur in Sweden, and murders occur in India. The question is not, is murder wrong? The question is, are they increasing, and how do they compare? And it's exactly the same when it comes to these allegations against democracy. Every country has violations of good demo democratic best practice. They do not seem currently to be particularly worse in India than in other countries. And for every example you want to give me about India, I can give you an example from a developed country that's done the same. Um, you know, Modi didn't allow the documentary to be shown from the BBC. You know, all right, well, there's a good reason for that. India has laws against inflammatory material that could stoke communal violence. The documentary was about communal violence. You know, there could be a legal basis for prohibiting it. That's reasonable. Should it have been prohibited? No, I, I don't think so. But that said, Australia is right now in a global debate with Twitter, with Elon Musk calling out Australia's Prime Minister, Anthony Albanese, over the suppression of video of a, a Muslim attack on a Christian minister in Western Sydney. And Albanese wants to suppress that not only in Australia, he wants to suppress it globally. <laughs> well, you know, at least Modi didn't try to suppress the BBC documentary around the entire world. He only tried to suppress it in India. Um, yes. You know, like I can give example after example. This is These things are done. I don't, I want to be clear, I don't approve of any of them. I'm a free speech fundamentalist who believes in absolutely liberal approach to democracy. Um, but I accept as a social scientist that these things happen. You know, countries are imperfect. And India, in my analysis, is no more imperfect than other countries that we accept as democracies. Okay, that helps. And, you know, I have a background in eco economics, but considering I do something completely different, I wasn't aware of that data that you pointed out to me, and I'm going to dive deeper into it again because of the work that I do. But had I not been doing this work, considering just the sheer amount of work that we have to do on a daily basis, the size of our to-do list, very few people are aware of the things that you are now pointing out. It's good that we have podcasts, that we have your you know channels like yours, and that we can learn about it. But how? much do you think the ordinary citizen actually understands these things because and how do you think they cast their vote because i wonder considering the conversations that are happening a lot of it is people casting vote for a particular personality and not necessarily the party because i think very few people are actually studying the policies studying the implications of those policies and under trying to understand the history of that party first ordinary citizens can't be aware of these things because the press and academia very much take political sides and press on on all sides of these debates misrepresent reality in order to create their best view of their preferred candidate that's sad it's sad that that happens in academia as well as in the press but let's face facts it does how do voters make a decision well we accept the democratic myth you might call it of the wisdom of the common person that ordinary people can see through all of the deception, all of the BS, and that people can know what they want. You know, H.L. Mencken, as an American satirist from the early 20th century, said democracy is the theory that people know what they want and deserve to get it good and hard. <laughs> that is, you know, that if they make stupid, they make stupid choices and they deserve to be punished for their stupid choices. Um, well, he was a curmudgeon, but I, I kind of agree with him that, you know, people do know what they want. And it's none of my business if what someone wants um, is a temple or if what someone else wants is a road or if what someone else wants 
is for India to, to be proud of India being powerful on the global stage. If that's what people want, that's what people want. I, I mean, I, went, I made a video advice for Rahul uh, about the advice I would give the INC. And this was about nine months ago or so. And I said, look, you just have to have a positive program. doesn't matter what you propose. You can't run on Modi's a dictator because 70% of the population loves Mr. Modi. You have to run on, here's what I'll do. And I jokingly said, offer to build them another aircraft carrier. People love aircraft carriers. Now, now India, in my analysis and most defense analysts and Western defense analysts views has absolutely no need for an aircraft carrier, but it's a matter of prestige. It, you know, prestigious, powerful countries have aircraft carriers. And so I told, I said, you know, Rahul offer to build a fleet of aircraft carriers and name them after Hindu gods. And people will go wild, you know, that we'd love to have, you know, the, in, the INS Ram and the, and the, and the INS Ganesh, you, you know, like that'd be fantastic. I don't advise that. I merely use it to illustrate that what people want to vote on is people's choice. And, and there's a profound uncertainty, even among academic experts, there's a profound uncertainty as to what is the right course of action. We just don't know. I mean, even if everyone were perfectly informed, I mean, look at the opinions of academics and journalists. These are extremely well-informed people, yet they vehemently support one side or another. And they're on both sides. Or not both sides. In India, they're on all 20 sides. Um, so does it really matter that people be properly informed? The most well-informed people in our societies disagree about these fundamental questions. And if the best informed people disagree, well, even in our dream world, the, the subsistence farmer would only be as well informed as a JNU professor. <laughs> and, you know, and if, and, if, and if even JNU professors can't make these decisions, does it really matter that the subsistence farmer is not informed? But considering put all of that against the, the, very real fact that now people are a lot more vocal and very, very willing to take action, whether that be in the form of something intellectual or taking to the streets and actually being violent. Put that against that idea. And people then- are not more willing to be violent. Look, I, I'm going to stop you there because we have no evidence okay. that that's true. There has been, there's the last major communal violence in India much to Mr. Modi's regret, I'm certain, was in 2002 in Gujarat. There is violence in India. I'm not saying there's not. I'm saying that India has become much less violent. The anti-Sikh pogroms are a thing of the past. You know, the mass Hindu-Muslim violence, which thousands of people are killed, thankfully, that's a thing of the past. It's not becoming more of a... People are becoming more peaceful as they come out into the public sphere, and I think that's to be applauded. I agree with you, but considering... There's like a, a lot of the discussions are invested in religious politics, whether that's coming from a good place, coming from a positive place, or whether that's just a tool to further an agenda. Considering all of that, where do you think this is going to go? Or, and what should a, a person, like a, a someone who is educated, someone who is able to access all the sources of information, someone like that should be focused on as and when they're looking at this? Because I... I was happy that the Ram Mandir was built in Ayodhya. I'm a Hindu. I was happy about it. I was not happy about the, all the violence that happened, obviously. But when the Gyan Bapi conversation started, and I heard this song on YouTube, some singer who was, is someone I like listening to, he puts out devotion music. Very, He put out a very violent song about taking back Gyan Bapi, and that really shook me. I was like, where is this going? I do not want to be part of a riot, not even to yeah. build a temple. Look, obviously, I don't approve of violence and I don't endorse calls for violence. And I think that it's terrible when these things happen. What I want to do is reorient people towards data. That is, we don't see evidence that violence is increasing. And, and if, I, if it helps, I can take this out of the Indian context and put it, say, in a U.S. context where it's less controversial for most people listening to this. Um, there's been talk in the U.S. about violent video games, uh, you know, encouraging a generation of youth to become, you know, shooters and killers. And it's never happened. And, and we've had 40 years of ultra-violent video games and young, you know, teenage boys going and just shooting thousands of people in a game. And it doesn't manifest in actual violence in society. The U.S. is a violent society, but it's become a less violent society over time, not a more violent society. Now, 
I don't endorse pop songs that call for violence against Muslims. Obviously, I would condemn that. I haven't listened to the songs. They're not in English. I don't know them. You know, obviously, I condemn that. India has laws against that, and I hope those laws will be enforced. Again, I don't agree with such laws. Yeah, the song was taken down. Yeah, but I understand that in India, a country that has a history of serious communal violence, I understand the need for anti-hate speech laws being more more in India than in the United States or Australia. Okay, fine. You know, we don't want these things. We want the law to operate as it should. I don't want to get too worked up over it. Or if I can put it differently, um, I'm satisfied that people like you get worked up over it. Th- that is the fact that people like you are shocked by it instead of people like you supporting it is itself hopeful for India. And, and, it, and it makes me as an international analyst say, you know what, Indian society can protect itself against this. Yeah, I mean, look, there's still there's still Nazis in America and Australia. Not many, half dozen, but, but they exist. Why don't we worry about that? Because the rest of society shuns this, condemns it, doesn't want anything to do with it. it you know, if there were a Nazi with a Nazi flag on the street, everyone would walk to the opposite side. You know, there are uh, pro-Hamas, pro-Palestine protests every Sunday in Hyde Park in the middle of Sydney. What do we normal people do? We avoid Hyde Park. <laughs> right. Normal right. people shun that. Normal people condemn it. Yes, it's unfortunate that, you know, a, a couple hundred, maybe even a thousand Australians want to support this sort of thing. But the rest of Australia shuns and condemns it. And that's what keeps Australia safe. And it's the same for India. We hope that people will shun and condemn these things when they occur instead of rallying around them. Uh, there is a potentially worrying group of very resentful, what you would call in India, the ultra Hindu ultra right. I hesitate to call them Hindu, I mean, but they self-identify as Hindu. So let's call it the, the Hindu ultra right. But it's a small group. Hopefully it remains in the fringe and hopefully it continues to express views that while people may enjoy it in a song, that they don't actually want to go do it. Just as many Americans enjoy things in video games that they would never do in real life. Now, I hope that, of course, things can change. And if, you know, if we do see serious, you know, trends towards violence around, you know, temple destruction, or I'm sorry, mosque destruction in India, I'll be more worried. Right now, I view it as a group of um, marginal people in society who may be popular, but who aren't influencing actual actions. Uh, I don't endorse it. I criticize it. I, I, you know, in the book I'm writing, I'll be, I'm currently working on a chapter where I'm, I'm criticizing it. But, but the fact that a society harbors something bad doesn't make it a bad society. Every society harbors bad things. This is India's, if you'll forgive the mixed metaphor, this is India's cross to bear. <laughs> the, the, you know, the violent ultra right. That is reassuring. And it is to be considered how much because they always say the negative stuff gets amplified online. Like you said, if there's a protest going on somewhere and we don't feel the need to participate, we don't agree with any of it, we'll just avoid it. And that's a lot of my friends, because I work a lot with Americans, I work with American publications, I deal with a lot of that, the cultural war that's going on in America. A lot of my friends would point out to me, my American friends would point out to me, that is not how it really is in America. The way you see it on YouTube, yeah. that's not how it actually is. Look, I don't want to name names, but incendiary um, right-wing speakers are very popular in the Indian media. The question we have is, are they popular because they represent a kind of harmless wish fulfillment on behalf of their audience? Or, you know, like, like if you're a Mike Tyson fan, you might love seeing Mike Tyson beat people up. He does it for you, so you don't have to beat people up. So is, is, it, a, is it a kind of spectator sport? Or are these incendiary people actually inspiring people to go out and be more confrontational and you know more prone to violence in their daily lives i don't know the answer to that obviously it's something we would worry about um but at this point it's at the level of worry not at the level of happen happening yeah i i like what one of the these um 
forgot, forgetting the name, but one of the religious leaders said, uh, he's, he's not a religious leader per se, he's just a spiritual guy. He is a religious spiritual person. He said that it is good that people, Hindu people have been pushed into reading their scriptures and now they're enjoying it and they're doing more, doing it more and more. And there are more uh, religiosity in the people. But if you are truly reading your scriptures, then violence is simply not an option open to your soul. People say that, but but look, you could find justifications for violence in Hindu scriptures. For sure. You can find it. You find it in the Bhagavad Gita. You, you don't even have to look that deep. In, in the same way, you can read the Quran, and much more than anything in the Hindu world, the, the Quran frankly advocates violence against non-believers and frankly advocates holy war. Of course, people who want to be controversial pull these up and pull these quotes out and put them on TV and put them on YouTube, and the quotes are there. Are most Indian Muslims engaged in holy war against Hindus just because the scripture has something that would just, no. I mean, it's just not happening, right? People, people rightly take these as, uh, whether they were meant as metaphors by the authors or not, people rightly take these as metaphors today and do not act on them because we're all mature people who live in society. And that's true for Muslim scriptures. It's true for uh, Jewish scriptures, which you can find things in the Hebrew Bible that advocate genocide. But, you know, whatever anyone might want to say, Israel is not a genocidal state. And, you know, in the same way, you know, even Christian scriptures, which are benign, probably the most benign in the world. I mean, if someone strikes you, turn the other cheek. Uh, they have been used in history to justify violence, but for the most part, people don't act on those those exhortations today. So the, 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 there have always been exhortations to violence. What's important is whether or not people act on them. That, that is, my hope is, and I don't know, I, I, here's where being an English speaker and not a Hindi speaker or a, a local language speaker, this is where it's a problem. I don't know, and I would not do I would not try to do the kind of research where I determine are the Hindu youth organizations associated with the RSS and the VHP, you know, are the Hindu youth organizations that had been founded by Yogi Adityanath that were supposedly disbanded, you know, are these youth organizations inspired to violence by the the right ultra right wing television commentators. Well, to do that kind of research, you have to do qualitative research based on interviews in the local language. That's not my kind of research. I hope people are doing that research, and if they find troubling facts, that they'll bring them to light. I'm working with the quantitative data, and in the quantitative data, there are no signs yet, at least, that any of this has become has reached the level of action as opposed to fantasy. And I hope it never does reach the level of action. Some people will want to ban the fantasies, but banning speech doesn't tend to prevent actions. So, you know, while I find some of this speech reprehensible, there are lots of things that all of us find reprehensible, and yet we accept them because we live in liberal societies. There is a point of curiosity here, for me at least. I wonder how much of the people, like the, the there was the establishment of the Waqf board. Congress has long used the Muslim vote bank, and they've done things that are really not okay to, again, I I wonder how well-informed I am so far as politics is concerned, but based on what we read, based on the interactions we have, we understand that BJP is using the Hindu vote bank, the, the Congress used the Muslim vote bank. Well, first of all, there is no Hindu vote bank. The Hindu vote is 80% of the country. And if you had the quote unquote Hindu vote bank, you'd win every election overwhelmingly. <laughs> right? So there's, <laughs> so let's, let's, there's no Hindu vote bank. There, there is a new India vote bank. You know, people who have a new vision of a muscular Indian civilizational state. And yes, the BJP leverages that vote bank. Uh, if you want to call it a vote bank, you know, if, this is a very Indian word, the idea of vote, vote banks. <laughs> um, it's, not, it's not a word that travels. It's not used elsewhere. Look, Congress has adopted policy, illiberal policies to satisfy a group of ultra-Orthodox Muslim religious leaders who probably don't speak for the Muslim community as a whole. That's a fact of history. Uh, whether it's doing it now or not, we could debate. Has it historically done it? Yes, of course. I mean, you know, uh, Rajiv Gandhi clearly did that. Nehru clearly did that. Um, the BJP similarly 
seems to stoke communal tensions unnecessarily in language that telegraphs to uh, that telegraphs to people who have anti-Muslim or anti sometimes anti-Christian but generally anti-Muslim views that telegraphs to them that the BJP has their back. I don't think that's a good thing to do any more than I think what Congress does is a good thing to do. This is the rough and tumble of democratic politics. Look, we have to accept if we're going to live in democracies, we have to accept that everybody has a vote. Racists have a vote. Sexists have a vote. You, you know, ultra traditionalists have a vote. Trans people have a vote. We, we all get a vote. And if we accept that everybody has a vote, well, they're going to vote for somebody. I mean, in the US, which has a two party system, much is made of the fact that if you're a member of the Ku Klux Klan, you vote Republican. That's like, well, yeah, because who else are you going to vote for? <laughs> you, can't, you, you, you can't criticize a Republican for getting the vote of the Ku Klux Klan yeah. the same way that a Black Panther terrorist is going to vote Democrat because well, the Democratic Party may not want them, but who else are they going to vote for? Um, you know, it, it's, it's just a fact of democratic life that people with extreme views do exist and they do vote. Uh, and since they do, parties will, unfortunately, it, it, and I don't endorse this, parties will unfortunately dog whistle, is the term we use, to those constituencies that it will protect them. Not necessarily support them, but will at least protect them. I don't think that's a good thing. I wouldn't do it if I were a politician, but that's why I'm not a politician, because I would lose. Because you, you know, the, the number one rule of elections is they're there to be won. Yeah, I read your recent tweet around that as well. And this the reason that I asked that question is because I would want to encourage my listeners, encourage anyone, you know, who listens to you as well to sort of look beyond that monologue that happens during campaigning, these promises that are made, just, you know, consider that while you feel like this person is in sympathy with you, you have to understand that they are trying to win votes. You know, they are trying to win seats. It's not what they are saying to you that is, you know, emotionally sort of alluring to you, but it it's at the end of the day, a tool for them. They're, they're just, it's a job for them that they're doing. I just want people to kind of remember that. And when, as and when they're standing in that queue to vote, maintain somewhat of a neutral mindset, at least one that is focused, like you said, on data. Data doesn't lie. Yeah, the, the best evidence we have and we don't have very good evidence on this. The best evidence we have is that people vote based on their personal experiences. So, uh, and I did some early research on this about um, mostly focused on, on Italy and other European countries, but I think the principle probably holds more generally that, for instance, people don't vote based on what the reported GDP growth is. They vote based on what the actual growth is. And there's a difference because GDP statistics are always delayed three to six months. And people will vote, people will vote during a recession to change the party in government, even if that recession has not been officially announced, because nobody knows yet. <laughs> you know, the statistics, the statistics haven't been reported. They'll come out in, in three or six months, but people know that they're suffering. Right? So people vote based on their personal experience of the world. And we aggregate that. I, I mean, remember, no party ever represents the totality of what somebody wants. You know, a party has a set of policies, another party has a set of policies, and I may like five of these policies and three of those policies. Um, yeah. It's never, there's never a party, and it's a, it, this is why uh, the whole theory of proportional representation doesn't work. And I, I'm very opposed to proportional representation. I believe in single member districts, that, that's a personal preference. But the theory of proportional representation assumes that each person should have a party that reflects her or him or represents her or him. And the fact is no party fully represents you because you want a little of each, right? Um, if you have a single member district, at least you have a representative who you can complain to if you don't get what you want. But here we're getting into kind of the minute of things. This is not my, my research. I want to be clear. W when I research Indian democracy, I, I, I'm not asking, you know, is a party doing something wrong? Do I do agree with this? Should they dog whistle? Should they do that? What I'm asking is comparatively, over space, comparing to other countries, and over time, compared to India's own history, um, are these things always present? Or is this something new? 
And what's been particularly interesting in my research is how much both Indians and social scientists have a lot of historical amnesia. <laughs> because when I say over India's history, I don't trust the history book. I go to the newspapers. Right. And so I'm pulling up newspaper articles from the 1950s, you know, calling, you know, calling, literally calling Nehru a dictator and that it's the end of democracy in 1951 because of the First Amendment that limited freedom of the press. And everyone's forgotten that now. And the international rankings rate India in 1951 as having a highly free press with little government censorship. And here I'm reading both the Times of India, which is the paper of record that I have in my database, and the Washington Post calling Nehru a dictator who's repressing the press. Um, yet now it's all forgotten. <laughs> right? So, so really what I'm doing in my research is creating these intertemporal and interspatial comparisons, not evaluating in absolute terms, is this right or wrong, good or bad? I simply accept that all democracies do things that are wrong and bad. What resources would you direct my listeners to? Because if they want to learn, if they want to add to their intellect so far as these all of this stuff is concerned, especially right now, considering it's election season and Although, you know, I mean, it is election season right now, but we're constantly forming our opinions and adding to the conversation. Where would you direct their attention? Well, first and foremost, to um, to my upcoming book, <laughs> which will come out Absolutely. next year. Uh, you know, I'm sorry to be self-serving, but the fact is that uh, in my research, I've, I have found so much mendacity in writing about Indian politics and democracy, both by Indians and by international authors, that I've had that I've had to go to original sources. And the only reason I've been able to do this research is that so much of the source materials in English. I mean, it, it, if, if it weren't, I would have had to give up because you just can't trust accounts of Indian history. I will say I recently read uh, Rahul Shiv Shankar's Modi in India, 2024 and the Battle for Bharat. I think that was a very fair and you know, fair-minded look. Uh, it sounds like it's a book about the election, but it's not really. It's it's a book about the whole idea of New India. There's some other good books. Dharmic Nation, Freeing Bharat, was also a a good book. Our Jagannathan. The other book I would recommend is again by Utpal Kumar, who's at First Post, and again a very fair introduction to the historical moment that India faced. And so Bharat Rising, Dharma, Democracy, and Diplomacy. Again, a fair-minded, you know, all these books are books that people will view on the soft, as being on the soft right, that is their, you know, they're not, they're, they're, they're viewed politically in India as being on the non-BJP right. But the reality is they just represent new India. You know, they, they represent this new idea of India that really has been around uh, since the um, uh, since the great book, uh, the book that really kicked off this whole literature, The Great Hindu Civilization by Pavan Varma, is one that I think every Indian should read. It's a fantastic book that, again, lays out this new vision of India that's developing. And these are all books that people should engage with, even if they disagree with them. Because they're representative of where India is going, whether, whether you like where India is going or dislike Indi where India is going, they all engage seriously and fearlessly with India's history, with no attempt made to rewrite that history or to make that history different than what it was or to say sanitize the history because they want to protect minorities in India or to glorify that history because they want to... Um, you know, boost the ego of Hindus. These are all honest engagements with history that are attempting to build a vision of where India will go. And I'd highly recommend all of them. I'm going to include all of them in the episode description. When is your book coming out? This time next year. It should be out this time next year. I'm wrapping up writing now. I highly recommend it as well. Because I think you've demonstrated why during our conversation, you, everyone says that you have to pick a side. Anyone who does advocacy work anyone who does policy work any writers they have to pick a side they have to lean in one direction more than i don't agree I, I feel like when you do that then 
I, as a reader, have to be very cautious in how much of that I internalize because then it's no longer a very fair look at the subject that you're tackling. That was not an issue I had with your content because I feel like perhaps maybe because you don't get as emotional about the whole discussion, you present a very fair perspective. And I think we need more of that. Or at least we need to make sure that if we are going to listen to people who are picking sides, that we listen to both sides. One thing that's really shocked me is how many Western scholars who study India are emotionally invested in a side in politics. Um, And and I think that's a a serious problem that, uh, you know, I'm coming to the study of India, not as an India expert. I I don't, I don't speak Hindi. I don't read Sanskrit. uh, I'm not an expert on South Indian Dravidian languages. I I, I never even visited the country until 2022. Uh, I'm not coming to India as an India expert. I'm coming to India as a comparative statistician. And so for India, for me, India is just a case, right? I, I did a book on China. Um, <laughs> I've done a book on the BRICS. You know, I'm doing a book on India. Um, it's just a case. And it's been shocking to me, the emotional investment of the group who call themselves South Asian Studies Scholars. They even have what they call a South Asian Studies, Scho- South Asian Studies Scholar Activist Collective, uh, SASAC, or S- SASAC, something like that where they go out and they do they do hits, including on me. I mean, my university laughed it off, but they do hits on various people. I mean, for example, um, Vikram Sampath, the, the attack on him for supposed plagiarism, which he showed was not plagiarism at all, but just the, he used the same source as another author used. That attack on Vikram Sampath was organized by this group. And they literally go after, I mean, they go to really obscure, sometimes obscure authors in the, Indian studies world and just like attack them. And I mean, attack like write letters to the universities, write letters to the press about them, write letters to their journals that publish their work saying you shouldn't publish this. Uh, It's just crazy. I mean, I've never seen anything like it in any other field. Every other field has disagreements, but the idea that a group of scholars would get together and have the time and energy to bother to attack people uh, and that's why I've been comparing the study of India to the study of Israel, and that the only other country that elicits such strong emotions in people who have no horse in the race is Israel. And it's strange, but it's a fact of life. And that's why I say you can't trust scholarship on India, because so much of it is politicized by people who shouldn't be political. But those authors I've mentioned, none of them are. All of them would be viewed as being on the soft Hindu right. None of them are particularly, as far as I know, Modi supporters. They all think Modi has done good things for the country, but they're not political people. I might mention another, uh, Gautam Desiraju. Gautam Desiraju is a you know an eminent chemist who, during um, I'm just looking for the name of his book, who during the uh, COVID pandemic, his lab was closed down. And he wrote a book on reform in India. It's called Bharat India 2.0. It's and it's funny if you look on Amazon as I am doing right now for his other books. His other books are, you know, the weak hydrogen bond in structural chemistry, crystal design, structure and function, crystal engineering, a textbook, <laughs> you know, and Bharat India 2.0. This is a, a a man who has absolutely no time for politicians. But read his book because his book, again, lays out a frankly nationalist vision for India's future that is, again, even though he himself has no connection to the BJP, Narendra Modi, RSS, none at all, his book will be criticized by the intellectual establishment because it challenges them, right? It challenges the history, The it challenges the, now no, Desiraj has a point of view. I'm not going to say he's completely unbiased. Everyone has a bias or a point of view. What I'm saying is Desi Raj's point of view has nothing particularly in common with any political party in India. But because he's challenged the established orthodoxy, um, he has been criticized right, by the established orthodoxy. So I encourage people, these are all great books that I've mentioned. Uh, I've read them all, I've enjoyed them all, but they're rare. I, I mean, most of the books I've read on India and its history have been so blatantly um, political that they they just, 
lie, uh, misrepresent. Uh, I mean, I go through and I'll, I'll read things and I'll say, I know that's false. I read the news article in the Times of India from 1937, <laughs> you know, and, and it's not what it said. It said something else. It, it's, and it's an unfair burden to put on a non-scholar. It's been an unfair burden to put on me, <laughs> you know, that, that every fact I've had to go back to the, you know, the period newspaper to check, did that really happen? Was that really true? It, you know, it's, it's sad, but that's the state of Indian historiography. My last question, where do you find the courage to be in very combative interviews? I've, I've seen a couple of your interviews where the interviewer, like, I think they, he had an agenda. No, it happened once. The, the, yeah. Look, I've had two combative interviews, and ironically, they've come from two opposite sides. I had the news laundry interview. No, I've had three combative interviews. I've had a news laundry interview, which went on forever and was, you know, a ridiculous farce of, yeah. you know, aha, you know, Professor Babonis was wrong about the GDP yeah. of Saudi Arabia. That was the one thing they featured. He got the GDP per capita of Saudi Arabia wrong. And, and you think like, if this is the worst you've got, you know, bring it on. They try to look me look, look ominous, you know, by instead of showing my actual video, showing a video of the laptop of me and, and such. And I did a ridiculous interview with Op India, which lasted so long that I had to take a bathroom break in the middle because it went like three hours. And I said, look, I, I, if you want to keep going, I can. But and, you know, again, on the one hand, News Laundry was trying to say that Modi's a fascist and how can you defend fascism and, you know, trying to get gotcha moments on me. Op India is trying to say that there's going to be a genocide in India in the 2020s. And I said, under and render Modi? Because I, I asked them, do you think Modi will be reelected? Re they said, absolutely. I said, and you think he's going to preside over a genocide of Hindus? Yes, it's coming. <laughs> <laughs> like what planet do you live on? And then I had a bizarre interview with um, uh, with uh, Raghunathan. I'm forgetting his first name. Very prominent media comics, Anand. JNU professor. Anand. Anand. Yeah, Anand of Raghunathan, yeah. uh, which was supposed to be a friendly interview at the end of the art festival, and instead he wanted to ridicule me. He wanted to ridicule me for thinking India was a democracy. When in fact, in his view, India is not a democracy because Hindus don't have enough power. <laughs> it's like, again, what planet do you live on? And so like, yes, I've had these three hostile interviews. Now I have done, uh, uh, yeah, I've done a hundred interviews. I've not heard interviews. the last one, but- uh, It's online. Uh, yeah, you can find it online. has said some things online that I am going to, I want to personally like learn more about because his, some of his comments have been very- strange and hard to wrap your head around so i yeah. he's a ridiculous I, demagogue and you know anand if you're listening thank you uh he's a he's a <laughs> he's a ridiculous demagogue and you know he's real he's very popular and, and so but you know it, it's not that he's necessarily wrong i mean he says things that are often factual not always but you know often factual he's just trying to put them in the most incendiary light possible um and so i had these three bad interviews but, but you I have done throughout. Thank you. But look, I, because I've done a hundred interviews on India, everyone's been super friendly. I, I, I've been embraced. I get, you know, I get emails from people. Thank you, Professor Salvatore. I, I get invited into people's homes. I, I mean, what is three negative experiences versus hundreds? I mean, I started a think tank to study Indian democracy and, and I've received 452 donations over the internet. From from people, most of them I don't even know. You know, we've we've raised a total, including the GoFundMe, but other donations. We've raised something like ninety thousand Australian dollars, or for those who think in U.S. dollars, around you know sixty sixty five thousand U.S. dollars. All of people who are just giving their hard earned money. Some of them are five dollar donations. You know, so how can I have a? You know, how can I resent three annoying interviews? when I've had so many wonderful conversations like this, met so many genuine people, and this is if I can have a message to put out to Indians to, to close with, it's that virtually everybody in the national debate genuinely wants to do what's best for their country as they see it. You may disagree with them, but the number of people who are nasty, unpleasant, you know, want to do wrong, tiny fraction. Most people genuinely just want what's best. And, and they may disagree over what's best, but that's what democracy is for. We, we don't know what the best course of action is. We trust that good people, that our neighbors, co-workers, our friends, our family, that ultimately they'll make the right decisions. 
And that's why not a single well-established democracy has ever failed. Not, not a single one. All this literature on democratic failure is based on countries that, that were hardly democracies in the first place. You know, uh, the Weimar Republic. You know, the Weimar Republic had a troubled 10-year history in Germany, um, you know, in which it was constantly being challenged on all sides with revolutions. And, you know, it, it, it wasn't a democracy. Venezuela under Chavez, you know, that, that wasn't a democracy that failed. Yet these are the archetypal examples you find in the democracy failure literature. And I say this categorically, not a single democracy that has survived 30 years has ever failed. And the reason is that once you have a democracy, people of goodwill just want it to continue. They, they like their neighbors. They want what's best for their neighbors. Not a single, I'm sorry to go on and on about this, but it's, I'm so passionate about it. Nobody in India, nobody in India wants Dalit regression. Yeah. Everybody wants Dalit advancement. Now, they may disagree over the best means for Dalit advancement. Every major institution wants it. There are only a few crazy people who oppose it. Everyone wants poor farmers to have a better living. We may disagree. Does that is that better achieved through the um, you know the Mandi system, or is that better achieved through liberalization? We, we may disagree on the means, but we all want it. Everybody wants it. You know, everyone wants women's empowerment. Yes, there are a few ultra ultra conservative you know, people in temples and mosques who want to keep women, to, nobody <clears throat> wants those people in power. Nobody accepts them. Um, they have very small followings. Uh, you know, it, it's a goal that we all share. The question is, how do we achieve that goal? And that's what democracy is for, because we have profound ignorance about what's the best way to achieve these goals. So we vote on it. And, you know, by voting on it, we, well, we arrive at a you know, a best compromise we can get to, to help make the world a better place. I'm glad you shared all that because we will, we are concluding the conversation on a positive note, on a reassuring note. And I, I think it is something that is, I know, preoccupying the minds of a lot of uh, people all over the world, not just in India. We are a, a lot of us very concerned again, because of how limited our sources of information or at least reliable sources of information are. And despite the information, how well we can analyze it, intellectualize it, and actually rely on what we have, our own understanding of it. So this is this is actually helpful. I'm just thrilled that people want to hear what I have to say as, as an academic. It's really a, a, a great honor that anyone in the public cares, <laughs> cares about your research. And uh, I'm very, I'm just thrilled and I'm very accessible. Anyone who wants to reach me can easily look up my email address online or DM me on Twitter or, you know, I, I connect on LinkedIn. I really love hearing from people. It's, it's, it's a great opportunity for an academic to have the chance to have a, a classroom that's you know, bigger than the, the university. So we've reached the end of this video. Thank you so much for watching and for sharing your time with me. The video description will have the link to all the resources mentioned during the conversation. And if you would rather listen to these episodes, then you can find Experimental Podcast on most podcast platforms. If you enjoyed the video, please do share your thoughts in the comment section. And if you want to watch more, subscribe to the channel, please, and do hit the notification bell. I will see you again in the next video. Till then, please do take care of yourself. Bye.